In today's episode, we go over some of the most horrifying bear attacks told on the channel so far. From a starving polar bear who rips into a man's tent in the middle of the night, to a man-eating grizzly bear who attacks and kills an innocent couple and their dog, these are some of the most horrifying bear attacks you'll ever hear. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. Welcome to Final Affliction. This story just goes to show that animal attacks can happen to even the most experienced and cautious hikers and campers. The tragedy occurred in September 2023 and shook the residents of the province of Alberta. Doug Inglis, aged 62, and Jenny Gussi, also 62, had been together since university. They lived in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. They were inseparable, both working as technicians in the same scientific lab. They had a deep love for the great outdoors and were certainly no stranger to the challenges that it can sometimes present. They each carried with them vital survival kits and emergency equipment every time they ventured into the wilderness. They traveled out to Banff National Park twice a year, usually once in the spring and once in the fall. But the National Park is home to some of the deadliest predators in Canada, grizzly bears. There are thought to be 65 individuals that call Banff home, with a further 20 to 40 black bears too. A family member said that Doug and Jenny were very careful people when they were on their adventures in the wilderness, whether it be hiking, camping, canoeing, or whitewater rafting. They knew bear protocol, and they followed it to a T. But sometimes, with even the best precautions in place, people can find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. The pair had with them their sidekick and hiking companion, their dog. The three of them stuck to signposted routes and always adhered to any warnings displayed throughout the park. But on that fateful trip in late September 2023, there were no warnings. No bears had been sighted in that area, and there had been no reports of them from visitors. They were on day five of a week-long visit to the park, something they looked forward to every year. They were making their way along Red Deer River Valley, west of Yahatinda Ranch. This valley is an untouched landscape within the park. It is inaccessible to most hikers, with no roads leading in or out of it. Meadows give way to mature spruce forests, and towering above the valley floor are craggy mountaintops and glacial cirques. The area is home to some fascinating wildlife, including elk, moose, wolves, grizzly bears, and cougars. The landscape is simply stunning, but its remoteness isn't for the faint of heart, and it has its dangers. After the fifth day's hiking, the couple found a spot to camp for the night. They hadn't made it to the planned camping spot, but wanted to set up before it got dark. They knew bears posed a real threat and didn't want to run into one as the sun set. It was a sensible decision. They had time to set up their tent and cook dinner before night fell. As the three of them settled around the campfire, Doug sent a notification message using their Garmin in reach to his uncle, Colin Inglis. The message said they hadn't made the planned campsite, but were setting up camp now. The message pinged through at 5 p.m. It was the reassurance their family needed, and it was yet another safety precaution the cautious couple took whilst hiking in the backcountry. They checked in with family twice every day, but what the couple didn't know was that there was a grizzly bear on the prowl that evening. As the weather begins to get colder, bears enter a hyperphagic state in which they gorge themselves on as much food as possible before the winter. It's essential for them to pack in the calories and pack on the pounds. They need to make it through the long, cold, dark winter months all the way through to springtime. Something alerted the bear to their presence. Perhaps it was their scent, the smell of their dinner, or the clinking of pots and pans as they cleared away their dinner. Whatever happened, their bear came for them. The couple, being experienced campers and bear-wise, had hung up their food in a nearby tree so as not to attract bears into their tent. They also kept with them a can of bear spray each. After dinner, Doug and Jenny crawled into their tent with their dog. As night fell and darkness engulfed Banff National Park, 
The two of them sat up reading on their e-readers, something they did every night before settling down. But outside, a grizzly bear was approaching the tent. They could hear it sniffing just the other side of the canvas. They stayed still and as quiet as possible, hardly daring to breathe. Then terrifyingly, it slashed through the canvas and tried to grab the couple inside. The dog growled and barked, and Doug and Jenny tried to scare it away, yelling at it. Doug reached for his bear spray and emptied the canister at the bear, but in a fury, the bear fought back. Nobody knows exactly what happened during those horrifying moments, but one of them sent an SOS message from the Garmin, which Doug's uncle received. It said, bear attack, bad. So last Monday, they started out and Monday night, like every other time, I would, at the end of the day, I would get an in-reach message saying, we're at our destination, everything's okay. Um, on Friday night, same thing. Uh, at uh, 4.52, I got a message saying, we're delayed, but everything's okay. And uh, that message would mean that they were in a camp, their camp was set up, they were probably making dinner, and they were messaging myself and Jenny's mom with that message to say that they, things were good. Um, 8.15, the phone rings, I got a phone call from Garmin, uh, who In Reach belongs to, and the message was, we've had an SOS message, and the SOS, not only was the SOS activated, which was a, is a button, but there was a message input into the in reach that said, bear attack bad. So at that point, we, we knew something was happening that was very bad, that they were in trouble. The distress message also immediately alerted a wildlife human attack response team. This emergency GPS device was yet another piece of equipment the well-prepared couple always carried with them. It was potentially a life-saving device. The response team were deployed immediately. The use of a chopper was out of the question due to poor weather and poor visibility. This was a serious blow. The rescue team knew that after a bear attack, every second counts, and now they were forced to make the journey on foot. They were specially trained individuals with mountaineering and medical training, specifically to attend to animal attack victims. Marching through the Canadian wilderness, they didn't know what they were going to find at the location. Nobody knew if the victims were dead or alive. They had to traverse the steep rocky terrain in the dead of night, their flashlights illuminating the way. They knew they were walking into danger. They knew that a bear was out there, and yet, they had to keep going to try and reach the couple in desperate need. At one o'clock in the morning, five hours after they received the distress signal, the rescuers arrived at the couple's camp. The scene they arrived at was distressing. They could see signs of a struggle and, tragically, they could see three dead bodies, those of Doug and Jenny and that of their dog. The grizzly bear had rampaged through the camp, destroying everyone in it. The three of them lay on the ground outside the tent. As they scouted around the campsite, they tried to piece together what had happened. The food was still hung up in the trees, and lying on the ground were two cans of bear spray. They were empty. The tent was flattened and shredded. The two e-readers were inside with their screens smashed. There were signs of a struggle that didn't occur in just one place. There was evidence that the couple tried to scare the bear away, but none of their preparation and none of their scare tactics worked. But the rescue team wasn't alone. They were being watched by the same grizzly. It stood just yards away, hidden by the trees. As they investigated the scene, they suddenly heard a crashing through the undergrowth. Turning their heads and spinning their flashlights around, they saw a grizzly bear emerging from the trees, illuminated by their flashlight beams. It ran into the clearing. It wasn't going to stop. This wasn't a mock charge. They only had one option. Pulling the trigger on a rifle, one of the rescue team shot the bear. It fell to the ground just feet from where they stood. Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrived at the scene at 5 o'clock that morning. They carefully carried the victims away and sent the bear off for a necropsy. 
The investigation into the bear revealed that she was a 25-year-old female. She wasn't lactating at the time and wasn't tagged or known to the park rangers as a nuisance bear. She was in fairly good condition but with poor teeth and less than normal body fat for that time of year. Her behavior had been very aggressive. If a bear has attacked a person due to defense from being startled, then it usually leaves the area afterwards. But this bear remained nearby. Could this bear have been hunting the two hikers? Was this a predatory attack? Attacks by bears in Canada are rare, and predatory attacks exceedingly rare. With just 65 grizzlies in the park, the last known fatal attack occurred in 1973 when a heavily sedated bear charged at a biologist as it was being relocated and released. Of course, this tragedy has hit Doug and Jenny's family and friends hard. It is difficult to comprehend exactly what has happened and the sequence of events that led up to their deaths. Those who knew the couple are in a state of shock, and for it to have happened to such an experienced couple means that it can happen to anyone. Even after deploying two cans of bear spray onto the bear, it wasn't enough to stop the couple's terrifying final affliction. Getting in the wilderness can be a great thing to do. Reconnecting with nature and relaxing in the great outdoors can really help bring perspective back to one's life. But what do you do when nature comes to you? This is a question that one elderly woman found the answer to in the most extreme way. When people talked about Adelia Trujillo, they would always mention how full of life she was and how she was a woman who knew her own mind and sense of self. This could be seen through how she lived her life. Instead of buying the latest technology or being connected to the rest of the world through things like smartphones and laptops, Adelia preferred to live a more simple life. Despite this simpler way of living, though, Adelia's friends always said she was a larger-than-life character. With a spunky and strong-willed personality, Adelia was a force to be reckoned with, so much so that she insisted on staying in her small, tin-roofed house in Mora, New Mexico, which she had bought with her husband and where they raised their children. Adelia also took care of her grandchildren in that very same house, teaching them the traditions of her heritage. At 93 years old, Adelia was also still incredibly fit, as she didn't even need a walking stick to get around. The hardy old woman would often spend her days cooking her food on a wooden stove, but it was her faith that kept her going day by day. Adelia was a deeply religious person, and she would make sure to go to church every Sunday as it helped her feel closer to God. Her grandson, Richard Ortega, would tell people that the older woman knew that she wasn't alone as she had her belief in God to guide her. He also mentioned that she would often go around blessing people and wishing the best for them in life. Whoever met Adelia often agreed that she was a kind, sweet, and deeply religious person who could get along with anyone. But no one could have seen what would happen next. It had started as a normal day for Adelia. She had gotten up, completed her morning prayers, and began to go about her normal daily routine. Whether that would be going out to the Senior Citizen Center to say hello to her friends, or simply staying at home to play some solitaire, she did not know. However, she wasn't one to rush about, and she would choose what to do based on how she felt that particular day. But, as the older woman was busy tidying up her home and sorting through some washing that needed to be done, she was stunned when her back door was suddenly barged open. Being a small home, it didn't take long for Adelia to get to the kitchen to see exactly what was going on. Thinking that it could be someone breaking in to steal some of her belongings, not that she had much in the way of expensive items, the older woman still did not want any of her more sentimental items being taken. She was ready to give the burglar a piece of her mind, but when she came face to face with the intruder, she could not believe her eyes. Standing in the doorway of her kitchen was a huge black bear. Startled at the discovery and extremely scared, Adelia let out a startled scream. She knew that the bear was dangerous and that it could easily overpower her in seconds if it should so choose to do so. The older woman would be no match for the huge animal. 
Unfortunately, her startled scream also alerted the bear to her presence and scared the creature. It is well known that when facing an animal such as a bear, the best thing to do is to react calmly and try to make yourself look as big as possible to try and warn the bear away from you. It is suggested that you wave your arms above your head and tell the bear to back off. It is advised that you do not make any sudden movements or sounds as it could scare the bear and cause them to attack. Sadly, Adalia didn't know these rules, and in her fright, she tried to run away from the bear. Seeing the older woman as a form of prey, the bear charged into the house after her. It only took a few seconds for the bear to catch up to Adalia, who knew that she stood no chance against the beast. As the wild animal began to tear into the older woman, Adalia was consumed in fear. Despite her age, she was not ready to leave the world. But it seemed as if she would not get a choice in the matter. The only thing that comforted the woman was that she believed that God would look after her, no matter the outcome of the situation. A few hours later, Adelia's grandson decided to go and check on his grandmother. He only lived next door, although the houses were spread out a little bit, and he liked to check in on his grandmother to make sure that she was okay and had everything she needed in terms of food and other necessities. However, this time when he went round, the sight that greeted him was one that would scar him forever. As Richard entered his grandmother's home, he instantly noticed the mess that indicated that something terrible had happened. He quickly made his way through the house, calling for Adelia the entire time, but when he found her a few moments later, he was brought to tears. The old woman had been mauled by the bear and was subsequently no longer alive. Immediately, Richard called the police, who put an alert out for the bear and began to hunt for it. In the state of New Mexico, it is common law to hunt down and euthanize an animal if it has attacked a human. This is so that it can be tested for diseases such as rabies, which could have affected its behavior, and to stop it from harming any other humans, as it is thought that after a successful attack, they may lose their fear of humans, which keeps them away from populated areas. In the case of Adelia, it took a few hours for the police to locate the correct bear. They managed to find it roughly half a mile away from the old woman's house. In the end, it was established that the bear was a four-year-old male black bear, weighing roughly 250 pounds. Whilst this was an extremely shocking and upsetting attack, officials did stress the fact that it was also incredibly rare for a wild animal, like a bear, to attack and fatally harm anyone especially in their home. In fact, at the time of the attack on Adelia, it was the first one in New Mexico to end in a fatality in over a century of record keeping. Whilst officials weren't 100% sure why the bear attacked Adelia, some locals thought that it was due to the scant availability of food that year. The weather had been quite bad with a combination of dry conditions, leaving plants with little water and then a killer frost which happened late into the springtime, meaning that hardly any food grew which the bears could eat. Even the orchards in the town of Mara were bare. This lack of food could have been one of the reasons why the black bear had wound up in front of Adelia's home that fateful day. With no natural fruits and berries for the animal to eat, it could have possibly wandered close to Adelia's home, hoping to find some rubbish that it could root through. It is also highly possible that it wasn't the first time the animal had looked through someone's bins for a meal. However, this time, after finding no available food outside, the bear possibly wandered into the house to see if it could locate something tasty inside. Little did both the bear and Adelia know what would happen at their chance encounter. But after seeing a small, frail woman who looked like a potential meal, the bear didn't hesitate to bring Adelia to her terrifying final affliction. Grizzly bears are one of nature's most terrifying apex predators. They are the largest of the bear species and are normally found in the northwestern United States and western Canada. The average male grizzly bear can be up to six and a half feet tall. Some grizzlies, however, have been known to reach heights of up to nine feet and weigh as much as 1,000 pounds. Grizzly bears possess long, sharp claws that can be up to four inches long. They also have a very powerful jaw, and their bite force is one of the strongest when it comes to mammals. A grizzly bear's powerful bite 
can crush a human skull with ease. Its sharp claws can easily puncture human flesh, and its razor-sharp teeth can cut through muscle and bone. In addition to their deadly claws and teeth, grizzly bears are also known for their volatile tempers, and they can be extremely dangerous, especially when threatened. Despite their size, strength, and short temper, grizzly bears are generally shy and reclusive animals. They will usually avoid contact with humans if possible. However, grizzly bears have been known to occasionally attack humans, especially if they feel threatened or when protecting their young. If you encounter a grizzly bear, it is important to stay calm and avoid making any sudden movements. Try to back away slowly and make yourself as small as possible. Whatever you do, do not run, as this may trigger the bear's predatory instincts to give chase. This is the tragic story of Leah Loken, the story of a strong and fearless woman who had an ill-fated encounter with this ferocious predator. Leah Davis Loken was born on December 16, 1955, in Corona del Mar, California. She enjoyed a childhood spent horseback riding and exploring the outdoors near her home in Laguna Beach. After many years of working as a registered nurse, specializing in surgery recovery, Leah moved to California and built a home for herself in 2016. Leah's horrifying tragedy began on July 6, 2021. Leah and her sister had arrived the day before at a small town called Ovando, situated in Montana. They were taking part in an ultra-endurance cycling event that ran from Banff, Canada to New Mexico, a journey of nearly 4,000 kilometers. Leah was a competitive cyclist who took part in mountain bike races. She never let her age weigh her down, and she even won the Mammoth National Champion Enduro Race in July 2015 at 59 years old. In recent years, Montana's population of grizzly bears has expanded into new areas where people now live and visit. Consequently, interactions between grizzly bears and humans have been becoming more frequent in the northern Rockies. It got so worrying that requests were even submitted to lift the restrictions preventing the killing of dangerous wild animals such as bears, not only in Montana but also in the adjacent states of Wyoming and Idaho. Upon arriving at Ovando, Leah immediately wanted to go camping outdoors. She had even found a perfect spot behind a nearby museum where she could get a phenomenal view of the beautiful night sky. Her sister and friend weren't too keen on her plan, however, as they had heard reports of a wild bear roaming nearby. Her sister pleaded with her to ditch the risky idea and stay with her at a hotel, but Leah was too stubborn to heed her sister's warnings. She set up camp next to the Blackfoot River, failing to take into consideration that it bordered a forest where more than 1,000 grizzly bears roamed free. Despite the obvious risks, Leah felt relatively safe as she had not only brought with her a full can of bear spray, but she also met Texas couple Kim and Joe Cole, who shared her love for camping and erected their tent close by to hers, giving her a false sense of security. At 3 a.m., Leah was fast asleep when a hulking shadow appeared before her tent. Leah woke up to the sound of snuffling coming from nearby. She wasn't sure what it was, but it sounded big. The mysterious figure soon approached her tent, shrouding it in darkness with its shadow as it began sniffing where her head was located from the outside. Leah soon realized what that figure was and began screaming for help. Kim and Joe woke up to her screams and began shouting as well. The combined noise made by the trio was luckily enough to scare the bear away as it soon retreated back into the darkness. After making sure the bear was gone, the couple ran to Leah's side to check up on her. She assured them she was fine and they suggested it may be best for Leah to pack up her things and spend the rest of the night at a hotel for her own safety. Officers said the food conditioned bear showed no fear of humans and repeatedly ripped open coolers and pushed on tents in search of food. Leah told the couple that the bear appeared to be looking around for something and that it even huffed at her head. Apparently that grizzly was food conditioned. Grizzlies that are food conditioned have learned to seek out human food which makes them highly dangerous as they no longer fear humans and more often than not associate humans with a potential meal when they see them. 
This is why it is important not to store any food in your tent when camping in an area where grizzly bears are known to roam, as it will only bring them closer to you. Mia thought that by distancing herself from any sources of food that may attract a bear's attention, she could spend the rest of her night enjoying herself out in the open as she always liked. Leah scoured her tent for any crumbs of food she could find. She put inside a bag everything she thought may attract a grizzly bear's keen sense of smell, including some lentils and dried blueberries, and started almost 30 feet away from her tent. Finally, she thought to herself, she could sleep in peace and not have to worry. What Leah failed to consider, however, was that the containers she used to store her food prior to the previous bear encounter still reeked of blueberries, something which a grizzly bear's phenomenal sense of smell can easily pinpoint. At around 4 a.m., the coals were yet again awoken by horrifying noises. Joe realized that the noise was coming from Leah's tent and that she was being attacked despite not hearing her yell out for help. After exiting their tents, the couple was mortified by what they saw. They quickly pulled out their can of bear spray and rushed toward Leah, unloading on the beast as it pounced up and down on her tent. After it finally had enough, the bear let Leah go and retreated back into the woods. The Coles noticed Leah wasn't moving underneath her now destroyed tent. They ripped the torn tent away from Leah's body and were mortified by what they saw. It was Leah, now sitting motionless and bloodied, her neck and spine contorted in an unsettling fashion as the nearly 500-pound bear had come crashing down on her with all its might, likely causing instantaneous death. After arriving at the scene, investigators found an almost empty can of bear spray that seemed to have been sprayed recently right underneath her tent. Despite allegedly moving all food away, Investigators discovered a small bag of dried blueberries inside her tent, as well as a saddlebag full of food that was likely overlooked by Leah just outside the entrance to her tent. In national news, we have disturbing details this morning about a California woman who was killed by a grizzly bear in Montana. Wildlife officials say that the bear pulled her from her tent in the middle of the night and killed her before fellow campers could use bear spray and get the animal to run away. Investigators theorized that Leah was awoken out of her sleep for the second time that night to the sight of the bear creeping inside her tent. Her sudden movements to grab her bear spray likely caused the bear to swipe at her neck as she squeezed the can of bear spray at the bear. Leah was unable to talk as the deep bleeding gashes now prevented her from screaming for help. Blinded by the bear spray while half inside Leah's tent, the bear began jumping up and down in attempts to free itself. It landed repeatedly on top of her, breaking her bones and killing her. On the 9th of July, three days after Leah's death, a four to seven year old bear was seen breaking into a chicken coop and was shot by officers. DNA analysis from the bear's paws confirmed that it was indeed the one who took Leah's life. The Davis family, who had lost their loved one in this tragic event, were devastated. Although hopefully they can find some semblance of comfort in knowing that the beast responsible won't be hurting anyone ever again. The tragic loss of Leah Davis Loken at the hands of a grizzly bear is a reminder of how important it is to be cautious when venturing into areas where these creatures are known to roam. No matter how well prepared you think you are when stepping into wild territory, sometimes there's just no avoiding an encounter with a wild animal. And as the human population continues to grow and expand into areas that were once wild and unexplored, the likelihood of coming face to face with the terrifying creature continues to increase. In the end, Leah's untimely death serves as a powerful warning to not only always be aware of your surroundings and take the necessary precautions, but to also heed nature's warnings and respect the boundaries of its many dangerous creatures. Otherwise, you may end up in death's cold embrace, your life withering away before your eyes as you're handed your final affliction. Durango, nestled in the heart of Colorado State in western U.S., is a vibrant and bustling town surrounded by towering peaks 
and rolling hills that offer breathtaking vistas at every turn. Here, one can hike through the towering San Juan Mountains, kayak down the Animas River, or bike through the winding trails of its jagged countryside. The scent of pine trees fill the air as the crystal clear streams and verdant meadows take away your breath. Lainey Melavolta was a 39-year-old backcountry enthusiast who enjoyed being out in the woods. She and her boyfriend, Justin Rangel, lived together in their home north of Durango Town. The outdoors here provided an awe-inspiring scenery that Lainey enjoyed exploring with family, friends, and her two dogs. On Friday, the 30th of April, 2021, Lainey clocked out of the Republic National Distributing Company in Littleton, where she worked as a wine sales representative. She was feeling high in spirit as she looked forward to a fulfilling outdoor experience over the weekend. She was a fearless adventurer who loved nothing more than exploring the great outdoors. In the evening, Lainey put on a sturdy pair of hiking boots, leashed her dogs, and set out on a peaceful walk with her two dogs by her side. She took a quiet, private trail near County Road 203 and Trimble Lane. The crisp evening breeze was scented with the fragrance of pine trees as the setting sun cast a golden glow over the landscape. Lainey found solace in the quietness of the trail and the breathtaking panorama. The outdoors was her sanctuary where she could escape the hustle and bustle of her job and reconnect with herself and with nature. The serene, winding trail passed through a wooded area near Whispering Pines Bible Camp. As they moved deeper into the trail, she could see the world fading away, leaving the three of them surrounded by the beauty of Durango's backcountry. It was a fleeting moment of pure contentment and tranquility in a world that can at times be overwhelming and chaotic. However, before she could wander further, her two dogs became alarmed, stood on their tracks, and their ears stood erect. They then began barking continuously while facing the woods. Something in the bushes had spooked them. Lainey attentively scanned the woods, but she couldn't see anything. She knew that her dogs wouldn't just bark without cause, but she had no idea of what her dogs had sensed or seen. And then, just before the last light of the setting sun disappeared, something emerged from behind the woods. It was a female black bear with her two cubs in tow. They were coming straight at her and her dogs. The sight of the huge bear shook her to the core. She tried to move, but her knees were suddenly too weak. She stood frozen in terror as her dogs barked and yipped in fear while fleeing back down the trail, tails tucked between their legs, leaving Lainey alone with the bear. At 8 p.m., Justin Wrangle, Lainey's boyfriend, arrived home from work. He was working later than usual that day and had tried reaching Lainey to let her know that he would be coming home late, but Lainey was yet to respond. Immediately after parking his car, he noticed that something was odd. He noticed the lights in the house were off and the dogs were out in the yard with their leashes still on. His girlfriend Lainey was nowhere to be seen. He looked through all the corners of the house and even the shed outside, but still he couldn't find her. Knowing that she often took the dogs for a walk along the private trail, he dropped his luggage and set out following the trail near the Whispering Pines Bible Camp to look for her. The sun had set hours ago, leaving the forest in pitch darkness. Justin searched the trail while calling out her name as the light from his flashlight cast eerie shadows on the trees, but the silence of the woods was the only response he received. As the minutes painfully went by, Desperation crept in and his body began to fill with fear and worry. A sense of despair washed over him as he thought of all the things that could have happened to his dear girlfriend. He couldn't bear the thought of losing her. At 9.30 p.m., one and a half hours after he began the search, his flashlight skimmed across the underbrush and he caught a glimpse of human legs with familiar hiking boots still on. The legs were protruding from a lump covered in dirt and debris. He got closer to examine the horrific scene and lifted the twigs and leaves carefully, crossing his fingers that it was not his girlfriend lying there helplessly, and if it was, he hoped that she was still alive. As he lifted the last leaf off the face and shone his light on it, his heart sank and shattered into a million pieces. 
It was his girlfriend, Lainey, lying motionless with her body partially eaten. Justin's hands were shaking as he grabbed his phone and dialed 911 to report the incident. Deep in his heart, he hoped that this was just a bad dream and that maybe, just maybe, Lainey would wake up. As he slowly came to terms with reality, Justin sat next to her lifeless body in the pitch black woods and wept uncontrollably. The thought of being alone in the dark trails no longer scared him. He felt as if his world had come to a sudden stop. Colorado Parks and Wildlife Authorities promptly arrived at the scene and declared Laney dead. For the second time, Justin's worst fears had been confirmed. The authorities immediately suspected a cougar to have been the culprit, as these wild cats tend to bury their prey with leaves and dirt before returning to finish feeding on them later. However, the officers also found bear droppings and an abundance of bear fur at the scene, and they were now more convinced that the culprit was in fact a bear. A search team consisting of Colorado Parks and Wildlife officers with trained tracking dogs tracked and located the female black bear and her two cubs, who hadn't gone too far from the scene. As per the Colorado Parks and Wildlife's policy, when a bear attacks or consumes human remains, it has to be euthanized. And so the bear, along with her cubs, were put down. Relocation isn't considered a real option in these cases, due to fears that bears might return to their original location, having found a new food source in humans. A necropsy carried out by a state wildlife pathologist revealed human remains in the digestive systems of the sow and one of her cubs. The trio was in perfect health with adequate fat stores and no signs of abnormality or disease that would have caused the attack. The sow weighed 204 pounds while the cubs weighed 66 and 58 pounds. The officers stated that the 10-year-old mother bear was potentially teaching her cubs that humans are also a source of food and not creatures to avoid or fear. This, with no doubt, would make the cubs potential man-eaters as they aged. An autopsy on Laney revealed that she had passed on from blood loss due to perforations on her neck. The extensive damage had been inflicted by the sow after its sharp and long canines punctured her jugular vein and other regions on the neck. According to the coroner, the sow may have taken Laney down by clamping her powerful jaws on Laney's neck and throwing her back and forth before dropping her to the ground. The sow and one of her yearlings had then partially eaten the soft tissues on her face and arms. Both the autopsy results performed on Laney and the necropsy results from the bears confirmed Laney Melavolta's death was the result of a bear attack. Her family and friends were shaken to the core by her demise. They described her as an experienced and knowledgeable operator in the backcountry who spent her life in the outdoors. Her greatest joy was to be in the woods, and she wouldn't have wanted to exit the world in any other place something that gave her loved ones some solace. As for Lainey, she did nothing wrong to invoke the attack. She was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, sadly leading to her terrifying final affliction. In this attack, there were no witnesses, and so the story of the events cannot be fully verified. But based on known behavior of bears and evidence left at the scene of the attack, the following scenario has been presented. It was August 1993, and 24-year-old Colin McClelland headed out from his home in Buena Vista, Colorado. He was a logger by trade and often set up his camping trailer in the forests near his home whilst he carried out his work. He could be gone for days at a time, making a living in the great outdoors. An hour's drive south of Buena Vista lies Cotopaxi and Wa Mountain. This is where Colin was headed this particular summer. It is situated near the Arkansas River Valley and about 35 miles southwest of Cannon City. It was an area that Colin was familiar with, having been logging there before. When he reached the site where he was to begin felling trees, he set up his camping trailer. He loved the outdoors and the freedom that working as a logger gave him. When the weather was hot and sunny, there could be nothing better. But that summer had been particularly dry, 
much of Colorado had experienced a drought, which had affected regional wildlife. Rivers and lakes were low, and food availability was scarce. This could have led to the following attack, an attack by a black bear. Colorado is home to a significant population of black bears. The exact number of black bears in Colorado is difficult to determine with precision, as bear populations can fluctuate and are influenced by various factors, such as habitat availability and food sources. However, according to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, it is estimated that the state has a black bear population of around 19,000 to 20,000 bears. These bears are found throughout Colorado, primarily in forested habitats and mountainous regions, the type of habitat that young Collins set to work in. But this was something he knew. He was aware of the risks of working in bear country, and he took the necessary precautions. He always left his garbage and waste food outside his trailer, and whilst out working in the woods, Colin always carried with him his high-powered rifle. He had come across bears in the area before, and he felt safer with his rifle by his side. It was the only protection he needed. Whilst felling trees, he always kept an eye out, and, apart from the occasional bold bear, most would run away at the sound of his chainsaw or upon seeing him in the distance. Wildlife officials recommend a high-powered firearm or bear spray to deter bears. Less powerful weapons are not recommended and are unlikely to stop a charging bear. Missing a bear or merely injuring it can enrage the bear leading to a ferocious attack and potential fatalities. There has long been a debate over the preferred bear deterrent, bear spray, or firearm. After working in the forest for a few days, Colin was bothered once more by a curious black bear. In fact, this bear had caused trouble before and was known to local wildlife officials. It had broken into nearby trailers, searching and scavenging for food. The recent drought had made matters worse. The berry harvest, a food that black bears rely on, was at an all-time low. Food was scarce. The bear was likely attracted to Colin's trailer and the smell of food and garbage. The following has been assumed from the details presented by investigators and wildlife experts. No one knows for sure exactly what happened to Colin. During the night, Colin was awoken by a noise. It was the sound of crashing outside his trailer. There was a commotion and Colin peered out of the window to see what it was. In the moonlight, he could just make out the outline of a black bear, the same one he had seen previously. It was sniffing around his campsite, turning over his garbage and scouring the area for food. It muzzled his bin bags, tearing them open with its claws. The bear was hungry. Colin watched from the safety of his trailer. He didn't utter a sound, but then to his absolute horror, the bear approached the trailer door. It was a thin door secured only by a single flimsy latch. Colin reached for his rifle. He always kept it propped up by his bedside. He clutched it in his hands, loaded it and held it ready, pointing it towards the bear. His heart was thundering in his chest as he heard the growling sound of the bear and the clacking of its jaws as it sniffed the trailer door. It nudged it with its head. The door shook slightly. The latch held out. Colin aimed the rifle at the door. His heart was in his mouth. Any moment now, he was expecting the bear to charge through the door. Any minute now, it would launch itself into his trailer. He held his breath. The bear stood on its hind legs and clawed at the door with its huge front paws. The flimsy latch gave way under the weight of the bear, and Colin fired his first shot. In the darkness, he missed the bear. The sound of the rifle sent the bear running. It fled the scene, but Colin knew it would be back. The bear had scarpered into the surrounding woodland, but as its courage grew, the bear returned moments later. It charged towards the open door of the trailer. Colin fired his rifle again. He shot through the walls of the trailer. This time the bullet struck the bear. Striking the bear on its body, the shot had injured it slightly. The shot wasn't going to stop the bear, it only enraged it. With adrenaline surging through the animal's body, it didn't feel the pain from the bullet. It didn't feel fear. Instead, it came crashing through the trailer door and before Colin could reload his weapon, the bear was upon him. 
It pounced on him, its huge frame knocking Colin to the floor in an instant. He would have tried desperately to protect himself, to cover his face, head, and neck. But the animal overpowered him, mauling him, inflicting deep and devastating wounds with its teeth and claws. Investigators who arrived on the scene much later found shots had been fired through the trailer walls from the inside out. They found the door had buckled and, from his injuries, it was concluded that Colin most likely died inside his trailer. But what followed will haunt his friends and family forever. The bear wasn't finished with the young man yet. The initial attack had been sparked by an injured and enraged bear. It likely wasn't deliberately hunting Colin at the time, but it had been searching for food and had been driven to investigate the tantalizing scents coming from inside Colin's trailer. But now, although the bear had neutralized what it saw as a threat, it was still hungry. After retreating into the surrounding woodland for some time, the bear then returned to the trailer once more. Now it was bold and unafraid, stepping up into Colin's abode it dragged Colin's body outside to the door, and there it feasted upon Colin's lifeless body. When Colin didn't show up for a court appearance a couple of days later, his friends grew concerned. He was out of contact deep within the wilderness. His friends went searching for him. They knew where he would be. He had been logging in the same region before, and they had visited him there in the past. As they walked up the narrow path that led to Colin's trailer, they made the gruesome discovery. It was a harrowing find for the youngsters, a sad and traumatic end to a young man's life. Willie Travnicek from the Colorado Division of Wildlife was tasked with capturing the bear responsible for Colin's death. He and colleagues set up a barrel trap 50 feet from Colin's camp. Sure enough, the following night, the bear returned to the campsite. This time it was enticed into the trap and the 250-pound animal was found there the following morning. Willie tranquilized the bear and sent it off to Salida, half an hour northwest of Cotopaxi. When the bear was examined, it was found to have a gunshot wound in its side. From this, and the fact that the bear was in the camp's vicinity, it was concluded that this was the bear that had killed Colin. In light of this evidence, the bear was destroyed. People should take every necessary precaution to protect themselves when camping out in the wilderness. Wild animals like black bears might seem docile, but they're still dangerous predators that should be respected and treated with caution. Colin's story is a tragic reminder of what can happen when we let our guard down. We should always be aware of our surroundings and take steps to ensure our safety, especially when entering the territory of fearsome predators such as bears. Nevertheless, while we can't save the ones we have lost, we can always aspire to protect the ones we haven't and hopefully spare them the unimaginable horror of witnessing their final affliction. Tomgat Mountains National Park lies on the Labrador Peninsula in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Covering 9,700 square kilometers, the park is famous for its gorgeous snow-covered mountaintops and breathtaking wilderness. The park is home to many a wild creature, including wolves, golden eagles, reindeer, and of course, polar bears. The polar bear is undoubtedly one of nature's most refined killing machines weighing over 750 kilograms of pure muscle and growing as far as 10 feet tall. An adult male can bite with a force that is equal to 1,200 PSI, more than enough to crack a full-grown human skull as if it were an egg. Unlike his brown cousin, the grizzly bear, who will shy away from humans and only attack if disturbed or otherwise threatened, the polar bear is hyper-aggressive towards humans and is mainly a carnivorous animal. Most, if not all, of his diet consists of meat that he usually hunts on his own. This basically means that the polar bear is a much more experienced hunter than his relative, so it's no wonder that polar bears are among a select few of apex predators on planet Earth that have developed a taste for human flesh and will go out of their way to actively hunt and eat humans if given the chance. This is the disturbing story of a nature-loving man 
who was unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of one of these beasts' powerful jaws, helplessly getting mauled as his ligaments tore and bones shattered while his friends could only watch in horror. Matt Dyer was a 48-year-old lawyer living in Easton, Maine, who was obsessed with all things nature. He'd frequently spent his vacations going on hiking trips, his obsession with nature reaching a point where tattoos of various wildlife creatures were riddled across his body. His story began in the winter of 2012, when Dyer felt the urge to go on yet another grand adventure. As he was browsing through a magazine, he saw an ad for an outing to the Torngat National Park in Labrador, Canada. Matthew Dyer had never heard of it before, nor had he ever seen a real-life polar bear, but felt reasonably intrigued by what he read and decided to sign up for the trip after doing a bit of research. Before leaving on the trip, Dyer's main concern was that he wouldn't be in good enough physical condition. To make sure he could traverse the terrain, he trained all winter, carrying around a heavy backpack while exercising regularly. The journey to Tomcat necessitates careful planning, registration with park officials, a lengthy approval process, and the carrying of appropriate equipment to ensure things go smoothly for all participants. Additionally, anyone visiting the park is obliged to view a DVD on polar bear safety. It's extremely easy to get lost in Tomcat Park, as there are no roads, no campgrounds, and no directional signs indicating what to visit or where to go. Visitors are instead strongly advised to hire a certified polar bear guard, not only for protection, but for guidance should they find themselves lost. Excited, Dyer later flew with a group of like-minded explorers from Montreal to a town called Kouya, which lies in northern Quebec. From there, the group made their way to a base camp where a plane would arrive to hoist them over the Tomgat Mountains and eventually onto the coast of Labrador. The trip was led by two of the senior Sierra Club hikers, Sierra Club being a nonprofit organization dedicated to conservation and education regarding nature and the wildlife that inhabits it. The first guide was 60-year-old Rich Gross, who originally worked for a low-income housing nonprofit in San Francisco, but since 1990, he'd spend a week or two each year acting as a tour guide on adventure trips all around the world. Accompanying him was fellow tour guide Marta Chase, a 59-year-old medical diagnostics consultant who'd been leading hiking trips ever since she attended high school. Tagging along with her was her husband, Kikab Castaneda Mendez. Dyer, being the nature-loving enthusiast he was, would have loved nothing more than to see a real polar bear in the wild, but he thought he'd be extremely lucky if he actually saw one. As a result, he was thrilled when tour guide Rich Gross suggested going on a hike that would almost certainly result in the group coming into contact with the park's population of polar bears. After hiking for a while, Rich Gross announced now would be the time to set up a camp. The camp consisted of a few tents to sleep in, a cooking area to cook and store food, and perhaps more importantly, an electrified fence that stretched around the campground a fence that was advertised as being capable of delivering an electric shock powerful enough to scare off any wandering predator, even though it was just powered by a couple of double D batteries, the same ones you'd likely find in a standard flashlight. The group knew the potential danger they were embarking on, yet they elected not to hire a dedicated polar bear guard, instead opting to just carry around flare guns and bear spray that they felt would be enough to quickly get rid of any unwanted bear encounters. After going to sleep at around 10 p.m., the group woke up the next day early in the morning to the sound of one of their fellow members announcing that he'd seen a polar bear close by the beach. Dyer quickly jumped out of his bed to witness the majestic animal. As he and the group made their way to where the bear was spotted, they soon saw a mother bear and her few-month-old cub only a few hundred yards away from where they set up camp. He was overwhelmed with joy. His eyes were fixated on the mother's every move, and he sat there admiring the creature's natural beauty, especially the young cub. Eventually, Gross announced it was time to head back to camp to have breakfast. After eating, they all geared up and went out to explore the mountains. They hiked through some of the most breathtaking views of nature, 
the icy lakes, the snow-covered mountains, the crystal blue water. It was all perfect. In the near evening, at about 4 p.m., they stopped near their camp and decided to relax for some time, as they were exhausted and their feet were sore due to hours of hiking. As they hunkered down, Dyer spotted a dangerous figure 100 yards away that seemed to be stalking the group. It was a full-grown male polar bear, 10 feet tall, larger than any bear they'd ever seen. Compared to the female bear they had previously seen, this bear was twice as big and had a broader coat. It approached them slowly, putting out its tongue and sticking its nose in the air as if it were evaluating the two-legged creatures it had just come upon. They spared no effort to scare the bear away as he kept getting closer, grouping together to appear larger and more intimidating and making loud noises. However, this did little to stop the bear, who was now rapidly approaching them from less than 50 yards away. Rich had no choice but to pull out his flare gun and fire it at the beast. The animal continued to move closer to them as the flare was shot. However, the bear turned and raced off in a dead sprint when the shot landed in front of it, causing a second blast. Realizing the danger they put themselves in by sitting down outside the relative safety of their camp, they quickly gathered their things and made a beeline back to their tents. The crew was ecstatic when they arrived at camp, since adrenaline was surely pumping through their bodies. Everyone appeared to believe the danger was over, except for Dyer, who was uneasy about the whole situation and felt that the bear wouldn't give up that easily unless it had a plan. And as it turned out, it did. As the bear would later be seen a few hundred yards from the camp Dyer and his team had established, it would simply sit there for hours, peering at the camp from a distance as those studying their behavior or looking for the easiest target. Gross wasn't concerned. That's what the fence is for, he told the group. As much as Dyer's crew assured him they were safe inside the camp, he still could not bring himself to fall asleep. So Matt positioned himself outside of his tent and stared down the bear as it watched them while the rain poured down. He remained there for over an hour gazing at the bear and being soaked by the gloomy gray sky as the day wore on, before finally giving in and going to sleep. The crew spent the entire day of July 23rd observing the bear with binoculars. The bear appeared calm and unthreatening, spending the majority of the day dozing out. Later that night, a group member by the name of Eisenberg decided to check up on the bear's whereabouts before dinner, but discover it had mysteriously vanished from its original location and was nowhere to be seen. On July 24th, at 3.30 p.m., the group would be woken up by the sound of blood-gurgling screams coming from Dyer's tent, as it would appear the electric fence was not enough to stop the 10-foot bear, who easily managed to break through it and reach Dyer. The unsettling shriek startled Rich to wakefulness. He reached into his boot, close to his head, and pulled out a flare gun. He ripped the zipper off his sleeping bag and jumped from his tent. Marta Chase's tent was right next to Rich's. She was terrified when she heard the frightening growls of an adult polar bear coming from the tent next to hers. As she made her way outside and peered through a small window, the bear looked enormous and white as snow aside from the black on its eyes and snout. The beast ignored Rich as its eyes were fixated on Dyer. It wrenched helpless Dyer from his tent by the head and began flailing his body around left and right like a rag doll, his sharp fangs tearing through flesh and slicing through bone while the group watched in utter disbelief. After Dyer stopped moving, the bear leaped over the electrified fence with Dyer's skull in between his jaws and made a run for it, likely hoping to reach the nearby beach where he could then drown his victim and enjoy his meal without disturbance. It was now 3.32 a.m. Even though it was pitch black, Gross and Chase could still make out that the polar bear was running away with one of their traveling companions in its mouth and things weren't looking good as Dyer seemed to have stopped yelling for help. Rich and fellow group members gave chase, with Rich firing and hitting the bear with multiple rounds of double flares before the bear finally loosened his clamp on Matt's neck and vanished into the darkness. When Rich finally reached Dyer's body, 
he was badly injured and unconscious. His jaw was crushed, his neck and lungs were punctured, he could barely breathe, and he was bleeding profusely. Rich attempted to radio for help, but was informed that because the region was currently entirely shrouded in fog, there was no prospect of them receiving it till it was clear. The group tended to Dyer's wounds as best they could, as they waited for rescuers to come save Matthew. At 8.30 a.m., after nearly seven hours, the clouds began to clear, and the reassuring sound of a helicopter engine finally echoed from afar and looked to be moving toward them. Matthew Dyer was promptly strapped to a carrier and hoisted onto the chopper. From there, he went back and forth to various medical centers, with none being suitably equipped to offer the kind of care that he desperately needed. Upon arrival, doctors would re-administer sedatives previously given to Matt before patching him up again and recommending a different medical facility. Eventually, Matt would arrive at the Montreal Central Hospital, where he would finally receive the care he needed. Medical reports regarding Matthew Dyer's condition were astonishing. The bones in his left hand were pulverized. Both of his jaws were crushed. One of his lungs and part of his throat were punctured and one of his vertebrae were broken. Yet, despite all that, miraculously no vital organs or arteries were damaged, which explains how he managed to survive as long as he did. Even more shocking was that even though the 750-pound polar bear was flailing him around by the head, Matt managed to survive with his spinal cord largely intact. Jeannie Wells, Matt's wife, learned about the horrific incident and traveled to Montreal to be at her husband's side. On the 27th of July, doctors would inform Jeannie and Dyer's tour mates, who all came over to see how he was doing, that Matt's condition was stabilized and that he could be discharged in a matter of weeks. Fast forward to the present day, and Matt has made a complete recovery. His love for nature and the outdoors hasn't faded one bit. He even got a brand new tattoo of a polar bear to symbolize his life or death encounter with this ferocious predator. Matt's physical recuperation from the bear assault may have taken a while, and although his voice was left permanently affected as a result of an injury sustained to his vocal cords, he now feels emotionally stronger and all the more appreciative of the people who contributed to his survival. Very few animals, let alone people, survive an encounter with a full-grown male polar bear, especially not one who managed to clamp down on their heads with his powerful jaws. In the end, Matt probably survived off of pure luck, and his experience now serves as a constant reminder that nature and its wild creatures are not to be taken lightly. Any situation can turn nasty at any time, and before you realize it, you could be standing at the threshold of death, watching in horror as your grip on life crumbles before you, witnessing nothing but darkness after suffering your final affliction.